Today, we're going to be looking at an alternate timeline where everything went perfect for the Romans. Usually in this series, I try to focus on short-term geopolitical ambitions of nations, seeing just how big a nation can get, while staying away from internal politics. The issue with doing this for Rome is simple. Rome is massive. Probably more massive than it had any right to be. Sure, we might be able to create a slightly larger Rome, but I want to mostly focus on Roman state building, especially during the era of the Roman emperors, to ensure that Rome, in some form, is a longer lasting entity. But this also means that this episode, more than any other in this series, is very subjective and based on my personal opinions and biases. So please keep that in mind as we dive in. In terms of early Roman history, I am not going to change much. I could say things like, Rome absolutely crushes Carthage without issue in the first war, instead of having to fight three, but let's be honest, during these early expansions of Rome, Rome already showed their amazing luck and skill by conquering most of the Mediterranean in a couple of centuries. And the hardships they experienced along the way were extremely important in shaping the Roman Republic, and thus, I do not want to change them too much. Adding to that, the Roman Empire as it existed, even in our timeline, was already bigger in places than it should be for their level of technology. For example, we could have Crassus or Caesar conquer Parthia, but this would have been a fool's errand to hold. Communication between Rome and the outer provinces was slow, and if a new invader threatened Roman rule over these provinces, Parthia and beyond could have been overrun by the time that the leadership in Rome even realized that there was an issue. But that doesn't mean that we can make no changes to the Roman borders, as I try to create what I consider to be the ideal Roman boundaries. In the Balkan, we will have Rome stop at the Danubian border, preventing Rome from investing in difficult to defend lands in Dacia, consolidating Roman lines. In a similar vein, the Roman conquest of Britannia was a vain prestige project, costing the Romans significantly, while it would be one of the first provinces that Rome abandoned due to it being a distant island. Legions, tasked with defending Britannia in our timeline, can now be redirected to Rome's northern boundary. Then finally, there is the matter of Germania. The Rhine is a perfect and very defendable border for the Romans, but I have one significant issue with it. The moment that the Rhine border is broken by invaders, there is very little stopping them from overrunning all of Gallia up to the Alps and the Pyrenees. If Rome was successful in a conquest of Germania up to the Elbe, the Romans would get three main advantages. The Elbe is a river, much like the Rhine, but when it gets breached, there is still the Rhine to fall back to. Along the way, the thick Germanic forest would slow down the pace of invaders as well. Finally, the total length of the Roman border would be smaller as well. Something like this would be my initial goal for the borders of an alternate Roman Empire. But the most important changes that we must make lie in Roman state building. The Romans are often compared to another empire of the time, the Han. Both the Han and Rome were states fundamental to everything that came after in their region. What's the difference? The Han, together with other Chinese dynasties both before and after, managed to create a somewhat unified culture, religion, government structure, etc. etc. Building a foundation on which all Chinese dynasties and governments after would base themselves on. In my history school education, I got thought that Rome practically did the same in Europe. Giving everyone Roman citizenship, spreading Roman culture and unifying Europe. But, upon further inspection, I don't agree with that idea. Sure, the idea of Rome remained a permanent concept in Europe even after the fall of the West, with many Western successor states still, on paper, remaining subject to the Eastern Emperor, while states like the Ostrogoths continued many Roman institutions, but never again would there be true unity in the Mediterranean anywhere close to what Rome provided. To take an example, even in the early days of Rome, the conquered peoples in Italy weren't considered Romans. People in Rome were Sives Romani, Roman citizens. The others were considered Latini or Socchi, who still enjoyed many Roman rights and could become Roman citizens, but they weren't automatically. Only after the Social War in 91 BC, two centuries after Rome initially expanded into the region, was Roman citizenship expanded to these regions. I'm fine with the idea of Roman citizenship being something that needs to be earned, but it should also be something that's acquirable, so that it and the idea of Romanness can spread better across the empire. We'll get back to citizenship later, but something else that needs a desperate rework is the Roman military system. Gaius Marius, this handsome fella, had reformed, no, revolutionized the Roman army. 
Around 100 BC, Rome was reaching its limits with the way they were conducting their wars. Roman armies were created only at times of war, via lottery amongst Roman male citizens. When Rome was small, this was useful, as Rome could lose legion after legion, but they just raised new ones. But it also had significant drawbacks. Soldiers, which had served the Roman army for years, becoming very experienced at combat, then simply went home, likely never to be chosen to serve again. The Roman army was also very divided by class, as only people of certain wealth were even allowed to serve, but even if it wasn't a law, Roman soldiers were expected to bring their own military gear, so only the wealthier Romans could even afford it. The leadership of the Roman legions then mostly fell to the consuls of Rome, the two leaders of the Roman Republic. This meant that sometimes, consuls with no military experience had to lead armies, sometimes with disastrous results. This became too much when Gaius Marius, as a consul, had to take care of King Jugartha in Africa, only to find that political schemes had ensured that no legions were available for him, and thanks to costly wars in the past, there was only a limited number of Romans that he could use to raise a new legion from. This sparked Marius to introduce a couple of extremely effective reforms. He allowed everyone to enter the army, and since the poor couldn't supply their own weaponry, he made the state responsible for providing the arms. With this, a new career path opened up for the poor Romans, become a professional Roman soldier, in exchange for wages and potentially spoils of war. With this, the Roman army could grow significantly larger, and more importantly, better, since standardized weapons and permanent soldiers could now make up the legions. These career soldiers could also become an actual standing army, ready to fight whenever, instead of just being formed whenever a war deemed it necessary. All of these Marian reforms were extremely valuable for the development of Rome, but there's also a negative caveat to all of this. The leadership and logistics of the army were placed in the hands of generals. Very useful to make the armies more autonomous, mobile and effective, but also extremely dangerous. With this reform, the army became more dependent and loyal to their commanders rather than the Roman Senate and state. This issue became extremely clear when Sulla marched on Rome and proclaimed himself dictator, becoming the first person to seize power by force in the Roman system. Two generations later, this would happen again when Caesar crossed the Rubicon to start a civil war, and upon his death, again a third civil war between Octavian and Mark Anthony. After the Marian reforms, on three separate occasions, army leaders used their legions to further their own interest rather than those of the state, because loyalty lay not with Rome, but with the general. Economically, the Romans also had a major issue with slavery and welfare. During their extremely swift expansion, the Romans had enslaved millions upon millions of people who worked massive tracts of land owned by the nation's elite. This extremely large number of massive slave plantations was so profitable that small farm owners were outcompeted and bought out, leading to them massing in cities being unemployed. With slave labor filling the farms, there simply wasn't enough to do, and the wealth of the elites just kept rising, while the government had to cover the cost of subsidizing the poor of Rome with bread and games to prevent civil unrest. Through this system, Rome's elite prospered, while the government bled expenses, and the poor remained without opportunity. This system would need to be heavily reformed, lessening the number of slaves while providing protection for the small farmers to reduce the burden on the people and state of Rome. It's a miserable situation that's startlingly easy to imagine. We now live in a time where wealth inequality rivals even that of ancient Rome, except now citizens aren't being bought out of their farms or crowded in the cities, they're struggling to find home while debt rises at one of the fastest rates in history. Now the past shows us that the elite members of society insulate themselves from times like these in markets that we cannot access for lack of connections or funds. But Masterworks art investment platform is changing that, opening access to one of these elite markets and paying out tens of millions of dollars through a pandemic, global conflict and now banking crashes. Long seen as a store of wealth, even in ancient times, the art market is currently surpassing even its pre-pandemic highs, enabling Masterworks to sell over 45 million dollars worth of art to date and hand back the proceeds to their users. In fact, every one of Masterworks' 13 exits has turned a profit. These users didn't spend millions of dollars or become art experts, they simply invested in shares of hand-picked works by legends like Picasso and Banksy with just a few clicks. By now, over 730,000 users have signed up to gain access, 
But there's a waitlist. But our partnership with Masterworks ensures that you can get VIP access to their latest offerings. And so to skip the waitlist, check the description below and let's dive back into the video. But back to politics, I consider the late Roman Republic an antiquated institution, no longer capable of keeping up with the expanding and changing nature of the empire, and Marius' reforms were instrumental in bringing it down. For this reason, we will keep Marius' reforms up until Octavian, who is now better known as Augustus, becomes the first de facto Roman Emperor. With Augustus being in control of most of the political and military power in Rome, he is the prime candidate to curtail the power of the army, to prevent army commanders from seizing power in the future. This would weaken Rome's ability to wage mobile, expansionist wars in the future, but with the Republic gone, the period of rapid Roman expansion is over anyways, as Rome switches to a more defensive stance along their borders. The hit in army effectiveness is worth it to secure political security, as we can now prevent countless civil wars and periods of unrest, as fewer individuals have the military power to challenge each other for control. Which leads us to the issue of succession within the Empire, as it was a bit of a free-for-all. An interesting quirk of the Roman Empire is that it desperately pretended to not actually be an empire, especially in the beginning. After Romulus, seven kings had ruled Rome, after which they had been overthrown and a republican system had emerged in its stead. Ever since then, the idea of a king ruling over Rome made many sick. This hatred of kings had also contributed to the assassination of Caesar, who had desires to become king and had become dictator for life, which sounded very king-like. This is why Augustus was the perfect person to laud the transition from republic to empire. Augustus wasn't a king, an emperor, or a dictator, he was simply the princeps. It just so happened that many positions of power within Rome were now centralized in Augustus, but he wasn't an emperor like you'd usually imagine. Thanks to this, as well as the fact that Augustus didn't sire any male heirs, resulted in a succession system based on adoption. During his reign, Augustus adopted many men to groom as the next emperor, usually within his own family. In the best case scenarios, a succession system like this could lead to a period like the five good emperors, as this adoptive method usually results in more competent men gaining power, rather than people born and brought up knowing that they will soon be the most powerful person in the empire. For example, this man, Commodus, came after the five good emperors, all five of which were chosen by adoption via their predecessors, while Commodus instead was simply the son of the last emperor, and, whether coincidence or not, he was more dictatorial, power-hungry and insecure than the emperors before him, ending what many consider to be a Roman golden age. It is during this era of the five good emperors that I want one of them to introduce an official law of Roman succession, something that didn't exist in our timeline, forcing the emperor to adopt their heir and forbidding their direct children from succeeding them. While this won't fix everything, this will surely ensure a higher quality of succession as candidates have to prove their virtue, leadership and good relations with the other Romans before even being adopted, overall leading to better emperors. Then I want to consider the division of the empire in administrative and military terms. Fact is, Rome is a pretty crappy location for the administrative capital of the empire. Sure, it's relatively safe, far away from the borders and protected by the Alps, but it's also far away from the tension points of the empire, especially those in the east against Rome's main rival, Parthia. I would propose, much like Diocletian had in our timeline, the creation of up to three more administrative and military centers. The first would center around Gallia, tasked with the defense of the northern borders of Rome along the Elbe. The second would center around the Balkans, also tasked with defending the northern borders of the empire along the Danube. While the third would be the most important, and it would center around the east, including the incredibly wealthy regions of Asia Minor, the Levant and Egypt, tasked with the defense of the empire's lucrative eastern regions. The final region would remain centered around Italy and be tasked with the communication, supplementation and cooperation between the other regions as Rome would still remain the official capital of the empire. While this would somewhat open the doors to large-scale rebellions, it would also allow for more effective administration and defense as there is more of a division of defensive tasks rather than one location to ensure the defense of the entire empire from. Here we must also mention the difficulty of continually raising armies in this new Roman reality. 
By the time of Marius's reforms, joining the army was a solid paycheck, while it also provided the prospect for spoils of war during Rome's near constant expansionist wars, as well as gaining land upon retiring. But these wars of glory, loot and conquest were now largely behind us, and by now fewer and fewer people actually wanted to join the military. Here we once again insert the idea of nation building by introducing some form of mandatory service, even if for a relatively short period, to get people together in the army as a good way to spread the Latin and Greek languages and customs, while also bolstering the defenses of the Roman borders. With the destruction of the slave plantations, there should also be more money available for the government to use on the military, since they no longer have to provide for the social welfare of its people. And with that, we reach the final thing that I want to change, the religion of the empire. The Roman religion failed to provide any form of unity to the empire, as apart from the Romans and the Greeks, others didn't really follow it, and it failed to compel people to convert. For most of Rome's history, this wasn't too much of an issue. It was an open and tolerant religion, compatible with most other religions in the Mediterranean, and only when Jesus was hung on a cross, creating a new religion, did this become an issue. Despite heavy persecution, the new Christian religion only grew and grew. A big deal, since the Catholics were monotheistic, only accepting their one true God, not the entire Roman pantheon. As the religion spread, the religion also caused rifts in the social fabric of Rome. But when Rome officially adopted the Roman religion, the reverse became the issue, as the now Christian Roman government and church had to contend with pagan beliefs across the empire, which they now considered heathens. The Roman pantheon simply wasn't designed to spread like wildfire to create unity, so we can do two things. Remove Christianity and hope that all is well from there and no other religion comes to challenge the religious unity of Rome. Or we can think of an alternate religion, more tolerant to provide a sense of unity to the empire. I personally prefer the second option, but it's difficult to see how exactly this would look. I have seen it offered that instead Buddhism could have spread throughout the Roman Empire, where we could even have Jesus as a figure in Roman Buddhism as an easter egg. But I will leave the specifics of the question of religion up in the open. But in my opinion, it's better for the empire if Christianity doesn't spread in Rome. But don't get me wrong. Despite all of these changes, by no means have we created a perfect society or state capable of lasting a thousand years unopposed. The Roman state and institutions would need to constantly evolve and change with time as Rome's borders ebb and flow with the welfare of the empire. Civil wars, rebellions, challenges to succession, bad emperors, none of these issues are eliminated from this alternate empire. But, in my opinion, this alternate timeline has two significant changes which I hope to have accomplished. The Roman Empire is in a better state to weather the immediate issues of the first 500 years, the period in which the West fell in our timeline. While the longer the empire lasts in a stable state, the more the idea of Romanness can spread throughout the empire. Much like China, I hope to have created an empire which can lay a foundation that stands the test of time. Not necessarily never falling or never dividing, but always getting back up, perhaps under different government structures, perhaps with shifted borders, perhaps even being conquered and usurped by nomadic invaders every now and again. But the idea that the Mediterranean is supposed to be united under Rome sticks. And in some form, Rome remains truly eternal. And that's where I'll end this video. Thank you all for watching, consider leaving a like and a comment to support the content, subscribe for two more videos every single week, and to continue watching, click on one of the two videos now on screen. Again, thank you all for watching, and goodbye.